we've had some really interesting live discussions with people in the studio. My favourite is one about friendship and connection at work, which I have always been a massive fan of and I think is really important and it's what kept me at the FT for a long time and many other colleagues at the FT but it's something that until the pandemic a lot of employers didn't really think about they didn't think about how to foster connection they didn't think that that sort of friendship was important but actually people leave when they don't have a friend or a colleague they can really get on with This is The Talent Show, a new podcast series from FT Talent, a hub of innovation from the Financial Times. It's hosted by under 30s for the under 30s around the world. This second series is about all the aspects the FT organization is covering today, from editorial to development, from data to talent. I am Virginia Stagni, and this is a guide we designed to inspire you to be the one driving innovation and change. Welcome to the show. new episodes of the Talent Show here at the Financial Times. We are at Bracken House and today with us in the studio we have Isabel Berwick. How are you, Isabel? I'm really good, Virginia. Thank you for asking me. Definitely a veteran of the FT. You've been here for 22 years, but also you are actually the host of one of the main show here at the Financial Times, Working It. Isabel is also an editor of the Working It newsletter. And today with Isabel, we are exploring a bit of the world of uh, journalism, uh, her career path, and especially the world of uh, work and uh, the future of work. Uh, I would really love um, you uh, to walk us through your career journey and your path in the world of journalism, how you started and how you keep smiling uh, Come, coming into the FT every day. So I started in journalism in 1990. I worked on trade papers for several years, mainly ones for family doctors. And then I graduated to the national press. Uh, I was the business editor of The Independent on Sunday, which doesn't exist anymore. And I came to the FT in the height of the dot-com boom, which some listeners might just about remember. They were offering jobs left, right and centre. I took one. They paid me lots of money. The dot-com boom went bust. I somehow managed to cling on to a job at the FT. I worked part-time for many, many years when my kids were small. So my career really took off, I suppose, in the last seven or eight years. How did you find your passion, your fire for journalism? How everything started? Why you you were so in love with the, the world of words? I guess that was it. And actually, I was very naive. I think I came into journalism before the internet, really. And I was good at English. I studied English at university. I could put a sentence together. I thought, oh, I'll be a great journalist. But actually, many of the great journalists I've met in my career are not fantastic at English. They're fantastic at getting stories. They're fantastic. You know, they're curious. They have tenacity. These are different qualities. You know, there's no doubt that it's great to be able to write well. And I think that's a gift. And I love that I've had a chance to develop it. But it's not necessary. And I've really changed my view on that. Isabel, if you had to suggest to someone now entering in this info-overloaded world of journalism, what would be the key skill set you look for when you are hiring a junior journalist for your team, for example. Is that curiosity still? I think it is curiosity, but I think in this time, they have to somehow stand out. So, you know, a lot of people who come to us have got their own blogs, they've been involved in investigations, they've done stuff off their own back. You know, some of them have put on theatre productions. It's, it doesn't have to be anything specifically related to journalism, but it's something that shows that you're making the most of the world around you and making your mark on it. And now you are a host and an editor of two new formats for journalism, for traditional journalism. One is podcasting and the other, the other one is a newsletter. Um, do you think your key skill set as a journalist needed to adapt in a certain sense? And what did you need to change in your approach to your job? So, yeah, you catch me at an interesting time because the last 18 months have been really different for me. I'm an old print journalist. I've been editing features nonstop for about 17 years on the FT magazine, on the weekend life and arts section. I edited Lunch with the FT, our flagship interview for some years. I have edited on the opinion page and I have just spent four and a half years editing work and careers, our workplace and management supplements. So... 
I've done all of that and now I'm pivoted into audio and it is a completely different skill set. It is about storytelling in a very different and compressed way. And I love it. And newsletters are another way that we can reach a whole new generation of readers. You know, again, it's a compressed way of storytelling. The newsletter market's been completely upended in the last few years. I'm sure lots of listeners have read Axios or Politico, these kind of products. You know, they have changed the way we consume news and features. And the FT is doing a lot of that too. And, you know, it's, it's reaching new audiences. It's reaching people in their inboxes. I suppose what audio and newsletters have in common, what I really love, is that they're intimate. You are reaching somebody's ears and you are reaching somebody's eyes. And that is a big difference from everything I've done before. When you talk about um, going directly to your listeners, for example, um, what are the kind of tips or tricks you use um, to reshuffle the story that you have in front of you uh, compared to what you normally do on uh, um, a story that is written? Do you use any specific tools? Did you need to learn something specifically? I think I've been really lucky that I haven't had to do it myself. I've had really skilled professional producers. So we've worked with an external production company company to build working it they have shown me how to do it and the key skill is to do less less is more in audio because you can't process at the same speed in terms of your auditory processing as you can reading so less is more and that's a hard skill for a journalist to do because we're used to cramming as much information into as short a space as possible What has been uh, maybe the most exciting uh, um, podcast episode you have been recording to working it so we can direct or our listeners to? Well, I suppose it's a different thing. I, exciting is we've had some really interesting live discussions with people in the studio. We did one around uh, maternity leave, for example. You know, is that a career killer? That might be something that some of your listeners might be interested in. Uh, but my favourite is one about friendship and connection at work, which I have always been a massive fan of and I think is really important. And it's what kept me at the FT for a long time and many other colleagues at the FT. But it's something that until the pandemic, a lot of employers didn't really think about. They didn't think about how to foster connection. They didn't think that that sort of friendship was important. But actually, people leave when they don't have a friend or a colleague they can really get on with. So... That's my, and I brought my former, well, my still very good friend, Sarah Gordon, on. She was my best friend at the FT for many years. She's left now, but, you know, having your best friend on your podcast is, I mean, that's the dream, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And, uh, but there is one thing about work-life balance, right? So, um, especially younger generations, they think about work as a place where to express their potential for sure, but also they are a bit more strict when it comes to uh, maybe the hours you dedicate to your work life, how much you stay in the office, how much you live it, especially when you start your career in this hybrid ecosystem. Uh, do you see, um, as an expert in this field, as a working it host and editor, um, any changes or anything that has been um, uh, quite astonishing for you to, uh, um, to look at when looking at Gen Z and their approach to, to work? Yeah, I mean, it is astonishing. And, and you probably see this, Virginia, in your team. They will say when they don't want to do something. They will set boundaries. They will expect high thing, a lot of things from their managers. For somebody who came into the workforce when we were told what to do and really weren't encouraged to speak up, that's, that's brilliant. I'm delighted that's happened. I mean, the, the blurring of boundaries between work and home has happened. That's eroded. But I think for Gen Z, that isn't necessarily a bad thing because they don't see the workplace as a kind of monolithic thing, partly because of the hybrid ecosystem you've mentioned. You know, those boundaries are blurring, but our personal boundaries, I think, are, are much stronger. People won't take on stuff they think is unfair or is going to make them burn out. Have you seen any um, generational uh, um, differences between the different causes that people push for in organizations or things that, you know, maybe are more important for the Gen Z, so all our listeners, compared to your generation of professionals? That is quite interesting for us. Sure. I mean, I think younger people expect to bring all the parts of their identity to work, and that might be LGBTQ, you know, they may... They may 
have a non-binary presentation. They may be, you know, from a minority background or a background that's socially deprived historically. You know, all of these things would traditionally have been hidden and they're now out and that's great. But I think the issue is how do we how do we meld our professional selves with our personal selves? And that's a work in progress. And I'm really interested in it and how it's evolving in the workplace because there are some intergenerational clashes and I don't know how it's going to pan out. I mean, demographically, Gen Z is going to come into the workforce. You know, younger millennials and Gen Z are going to run everything. Everything will change, I hope. But, you know, there's there's a few road bumps along the way. Um, we have been asking Visa to all our guests. Um, how did you present yourself when uh, you enter in the workplace? And uh, have you seen any changes or any ways of like younger people entering the workforce and having a bit of a different branding attitude or way of presenting themselves and their stories? Yeah, I think... I presented myself age 23 as pretty much looking like I was 50. I think I look younger now than I did then. <laughs> okay. I wore, I literally wore my mother's clothes to go to work because that's what you did. Because okay. you had to look professional in a kind of traditional way. And now people come as themselves. Now, I think the whole area of workplace dress is, a, is ripe for a podcast, actually, because that's become much more informal. But, you know, the, the sort of tailored, you know, slightly too tight clothing that we had to put up with, that's all gone. I never wear heels anymore. I only wear trainers. That's great. That's all. A lot of that's driven by the pandemic. So when young people are coming into the workplace, you know, there are some faux pas. I've had, you know, senior friends who've had to tell their younger workers that it's not appropriate to wear particular items to work to meet clients. But I'm not even sure that's OK anymore. I think all the rules are changing and you have to bring what you think is the right attire to work. And that can take a while. So I guess my advice would be on your first day, if it is a face to face situation, you know, perhaps err on the conservative side and just take the vibe of what's going on in the office. You know, it's a, it's it's a much looser and thing and you can be yourself. You don't have to be your mother anymore. So you don't need to be your mother anymore. And I think that's a, that's a very interesting way of, see, of seeing how to present yourself at work. Um, from your experience with working it, um, what are the best ways we can encourage younger people to not work in a siloed way? but a bit more horizontally, collaboratively, interdepartmentally, even when organizations are not made that way? So I think you've got to pick your organization. I mean, there are, I guess if you can get yourself on, cro on cross-departmental projects, that's really important. And that's about being seen and getting to know people outside your immediate team. You know, it may be that there's early career meetings or mentorships. You know, be on the lookout for any opportunity. You might want to join an, uh, an employee group, for example. Uh, that's a way to meet people. It used to be that the smokers were the, fan were the most fantastic kind of horizontal, you know, they the people in the smoking corner were from all sorts of places in the business and that was the information channel and there was actual research done on how information passes through corporates through smokers because they were from all over the business so how do we replicate the smokers in a healthy way uh joining something doing something being out there it may be that your company slack has a kind of general interest board or there are internal events you could run there are all sorts of ways But, you know, I'd give it a couple of years. And if it's not working for you or if the corporate environment is not suiting you, think again. I think this is really interesting because we uh, we talk about work-life balance. We talk about expressing your potential. But at the same time, I think it's really important to be um, a woman or a man within the organization and really trying to connect. You talked about friendship. You talk about companionship in a certain sense within the company. And I think we all drive for a very similar mission. Have you ever um, seen or checked companies that have uh, been uh, um, drafting their mission with a bottom-up approach, so a bit more democratic approach to how you drive a mission, a North Star goal for an organization? Have you, do you have any example you would like to share that maybe our uh, younger uh, listeners can be inspired by? I mean, the only thing I can think of is that when the big tech companies, and they may not do this anymore, they allowed, you know, 
10 or 20% of employees' time for moonshots, for their own thinking and creativity. And I think that's perhaps the best thing that any company can do. There are companies who have flat management structures or have no managers. I mean, that's pretty radical. But I wouldn't describe it as bottom-up. I'd describe it as collaborative. I'm very interested in seeing what happens with the the kind of match with um, um, information providers out there. I'm thinking about the influencers, people that have something to say. And uh, you guys as journalists do actually look at new trends and new things happening uh, online. And how do we integrate these two words, especially in journalism? Do you have any idea on that? Maybe that is a bit more on, on journalism. And how do you see your transition with uh, your job and external uh, infotainment happening? And how do we integrate rather than seeing it as uh, the evil side? I've never seen it as the evil side. I've always been a massive consumer of social media, the internet. I was a very early adopter. My kids are Gen Z. I'm on TikTok all the time. I haven't got a TikTok account, but I'm thinking about it because I see a lot of interesting career content and there. I think the the key for brands like the FT and what we're doing here and working it and FT Talent is to get our authoritative message out there in a way that can be consumed because the problem at the moment is the bottom-up influencers quite often don't have the right information. You know, I can guarantee you my son never looks at a mainstream paper. Where does he get his information? YouTube mainly and TikTok. He's extremely well informed. He's smart. He's 19, but he's very suspicious of the mainstream media. And so that this whole thing of how do we exist in that world is a is a work in progress. And I think that it might be the big job of the next five years for brands like ours to scope out that landscape and see what added value we can give and and to you know make ourselves an authoritative voice there. Isabel, another key question is about stress and burnout. Do you have any tips for younger people entering in the workforce? How do you mitigate this risk? What are the kind of like um boundaries you can set? Or how would you approach it if you are in your 20s and you really want to stand out, you're an overachiever? What do you do to not risk your health? for success at work. Yeah, you want to be in it for the long term. And actually, a lot of people do burn out in their 20s. I I suppose I take a structural look first because I get quite annoyed with all these companies offering wellness apps to their staff and, you know, meditation and whatnot. But actually, they're absolutely overloading them with workload. Is there a structural problem in your workplace with workload? Because that's the cause of stress and burnout. Too much work. So have you been given too much work? And I guess the first point of call is your manager. And it's very difficult to say I've got too much work if you're in your 20s and you're just starting. So I guess talk to colleagues, see what your manager says, see what resources are available internally, because a lot of companies have great stress management resources now. But be mindful of what it is you're being asked to do, because humans consistently think we can do more in the time allotted to us than we actually can. And your manager may feel that you can do more. And you may be just learning. You may need more time. So this is a very sort of subjective thing to get right. And I think your main priority has to be to think about the long term. If you burn out in your mid-20s, you may find a different path. But if you had your heart set on a corporate career, certainly in your 20s and 30s, don't let that go. You know, be preventive. Set boundaries. Don't take on that extra project. I'm not saying never take on extra projects or extra work, but don't take on the extra work that isn't going to be, well, we call them NPTs, non-promotable tasks. Is it a promotable task or is it not? And particularly if you're a woman, that is the sort of thing that happens. A lot of what we might call office housekeeping is done by women, note-taking, scheduling stuff, you know, even things like collections for people who are leaving. Who does that in your office? That's extra stress. I think this is an, um, a very good, very good point and suggestion for, for our listeners. Let's talk to our women listener, our female uh, um, listeners out there. You are a young woman entering in the world space. Um, uh, we have, uh, of course, a lot of opportunities at the moment. 
Do you have any suggestion for our listeners in their 20s, how they would approach the workforce uh, if they have in any different way than you did in your own 20s? Would you recommend something specific to them? Yeah, I, I think, I don't think they need me to tell them, but I'm going to say it, is have a plan. It may not work out. You know, we're, we're not in control of our life. You know, the illusion of control is very powerful, particularly in a workplace, except that you haven't got that much control. But what can you control? What you control are people, essentially, your contacts. It is, you know, people are promoted or get a new job because of who they know. And it's often not their best friends. It's what we would call loose ties. So people who might be in your team or in another team or former colleagues or friends of friends or former managers or people you've got to know on LinkedIn because you moderated a panel with them. So the loose tie, I think, is the key to everything in your 20s. I wish I'd known about it. It probably wasn't even a term that had been coined, but it is so powerful And so often we go to our best friends and they will, you know, commiserate with us about our problems at work. And that's their job. Our partners and our friends and our family are there to support us 100 percent. And so are our therapists. But our loose ties are the people that can open the doors for us. And I think that's time well invested in your 20s. And I think this is a key suggestion because that's the thing that we say to all the challengers that do come along to our programs or get in touch with um, with the FT world is use us as your potential bridge between academia and the real world out there. Do you have any interesting um, mentoring uh, moments that you shared with uh, maybe some of your colleagues where you also got something out of it? from maybe a younger employee that inspired you to do something or um, maybe, you know, one example or one episode that you would like to um, to quote here? Yeah, I mean, mentoring sponsorship is, is pretty recent in the workplace, perhaps not in some big corporates, but certainly in the media. This is not something that really happened. These were, yeah, I cannot stress how traditional a workplace a national newspaper was in the 1990s and early 2000s. That's changed enormously, but I was never mentored. It wasn't a thing at all. And so people of my generation are coming to this late. I have had some really interesting moments talking to younger colleagues. I think my most clarifying moment was after I wrote a column about pay transparency and salary transparency. It was at a time when people had started sharing those anonymous spreadsheets of what they're paid in different jobs. Um, it's a kind of underground movement that's still growing, I think. And I wrote about this and I wrote about our discomfort with talking about how much we earn. I went for co uh, a coffee with a younger colleague and she just came straight out and said, how much do you earn? And I was really thrown. But I, and she told me what she earned and I did tell her what I earned. And I thought, actually, that's a really clarifying moment because if I write about it, I might not want to put my salary in print. Maybe I will one day, but... I have to be prepared to follow through with younger people who expect honesty. And I, I suppose that was the first lesson I learned. I have a, I'm a sponsor now for a, a young journalist at the FT. I'm just starting out on that journey and I really hope I'm going to do it properly. That's so good. Let's welcome our challengers in the studio so uh, they can ask their questions directly to Isabel. Isabel, thank you so much for this. Pleasure. Alexander and Yasmin, please welcome to the show. Alexander, why don't we go over your journey here? What was your challenge here? What did you do? And uh, please, of course, uh, ask your question to Isabel. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, so I was, my name is Alexander and I was part of the FTX Bocconi Talent Challenge in 2020. I am from Italy, but originally from Ukraine. And I'm now working in London as part of my industrial placement at university. So as part of my course in Nottingham. And my question is about modern productivity. So I'm somebody who consumes a lot of um, work-related content and productivity content. And I strive to be to stand out and be the best I can at work. And I'm sure many can relate to that. But to achieve this goal, I'm sold the notion that if I want to achieve that or anything in my life, I need to 
uh, follow the seven tips for success of a book or read 20 minutes a book or meditate, eat healthy, exercise and all this kind of stuff. I would like to know your thoughts on this and if this notion is actually, if you agree with this notion, if this notion is, can actually bring that kind of success that I'm looking for and many are. That's a really great question. And I, I also consume a lot of productivity content, not in a very productive way, though. Though I have got an, uh, a subscription to an app where they distill books down to sort of 10 or 15 minutes. So that's one of my tips. Um, get one of these apps where it'll tell you, because a lot of books actually boil down to not very much, don't they? Exactly the seven tips or the seven chapters. I suppose what is your end goal? You know, because ultimately, if we become more and more and more productive, we're producing more and more and more output. Is that what we want. I mean, the mo- the biggest, the book that's had the biggest impact on me has been a book called 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman, which is about essentially how much time we have and how we use it. And that made me radically reframe how I thought about productivity because it's about us as humans and how much limited time we have on earth. And just putting it in that kind of global context stop the treadmill of me constantly consuming this productivity content it sounds like we're quite similar although I'm sure you're more productive than I am because I'm a journalist and we spend a lot of time (laughs) sitting around chatting in a very constructive way but you know I I suppose and also it doesn't really matter what you do I but I think it's about sticking with it isn't it I don't know what do you think what's your favorite productivity hack um First of all, I think that everyone is different and there is no one rule fits all for this kind of stuff to to achieve success in life, whatever that is. Um, I really like doing all kinds of stuff. Don't want to invest too much into... Because we we talked about, you guys talked about before, that um, we are very tiring and we talked about you talked about meditation as well i do actually find sometimes that when i commit myself to doing meditation every day for 30 minutes that is tiring me instead of giving me energy so i I don't really know what the solution is that's that's why i was happy to come here and talk to you i think you'll you'll find what works for you and it might be quite haphazard it might not be following the path of the stoics or following the path of you know maximum productivity I suppose work tech has changed the way we work. You know, we're already massively more productive, probably in real terms, than people were even 10 years ago. Tools like Slack have changed the way people communicate in quite a profound way. And I wouldn't be too hard on yourself because when you think about how we used to work, we were, you know, there was far more Slack in the system and now there isn't. And so every, probably every single minute of your working day is taken up. I, I mean, my tip is really when I get really overwhelmed and het up which is quite often I sudden sometimes forget just that breathing can you know what I mean I just go outside for five minutes and then you're much more productive something really simple actually is often the key you might want to start a morning routine and get up at half past four like a lot of these lead tech leaders do but that you know if that isn't your aim I don't know, try try a few things out, see what sticks. I've done a bit of Pomodoro over time. I've done, uh, I've never done Inbox Zero because that's hopeless. I've done, you know, writing down five things before bed that you pick up in the morning. I mean, they're all quite effective, but none of them have stuck. The only thing that sticks is thinking about what is really, really important and prioritising that. And I think in journalism, we're lucky because it's very clear to us what the most important things are because we have deadlines. And so those things are what we do. I have hundreds and hundreds of people coming into my inbox who I never answer, and I feel bad about that. But the Oliver Berkman book allowed me to reframe that as they've come into my inbox unbidden. I didn't ask them. They're not part of my job, and I can't do everything. I will burn out if I answer every email. So I think the tools of journalism are quite useful in life because we ruthlessly prioritise what is most important. And your brain does that for you. Yasmin, over to you. Hi, um, I'm Yasmin. I'm from Italy as well, but I'm originally Moroccan. And I also took part in the Financial Times Bocconi Challenge last year. Um, And at the moment, I'm working as a retailer relations executive. Um, but I'm looking to change to a new position in journalism as well. Um, And my question 
and it's related to your career. I was wondering, um, since you did change um, career, like when did you know when it was the right time for you to change path? Um, when the opportunity arose, I wish I could pretend otherwise. I wish I could pretend. I mean, I suppose what I can say is that I have been a very heavy consumer of podcasts for many years. I was a very early adopter. I've been listening to podcasts since probably 2008, 2009. I loved them. I love the intimacy of them. I love the fact I can listen to them when I'm going about doing other things. I never thought that I would be hosting a podcast but I you know sometimes things that don't seem to have importance in your life can really lay the groundwork for, for a change so I suppose that there might be things in your life that you don't realize are going to be really valuable to you in the future um uh, yes I also what you mentioned earlier on about um you know using your connections and it could be loose ties I mean I really enjoy the people that I work with at the moment but it is also through them that I've been inspired to you know go into journalism inspire you to change uh yes they've all like told me you know to go for what I'm really interested in um um and you know I've always been into research and current events so that's what pushed me great i'd be delighted to hear how you get on yes yeah, so hopefully i'll have exciting updates yeah please so thank you so much guys thanks for your questions and of course thank you so much isabel for sharing with us uh, your journey your um, points and your clarity and as well i think being so intimate in the way you've been sharing about your uh, your perspective on uh, work careers and especially intergenerational connections and uh, thank you so much for supporting us as ft talent and uh, again as we always say and it's going to be in the ads right after this listen to working it is hosted by Isabel Bowick and read Working It newsletter, which uh, I think we uh, connect to in all our social media posting as well. So all the articles are curated by um, Isabel's team as well that is uh, giving us the tips for you guys. So thank you so much. Thanks for listening and thanks uh, you guys for coming and thanks Isabel for being with us. Thanks for having me. This has been The Talent Show, which is produced by the FT Talent team, Aya Al-Shihabi, and me, Virginia Stagni. Our podcast producer, editor and sound engineer is Arturo Ochoa, and our social media producer is Letizia Clementi. Our music is by Dennis Kishuk. Check out all of the Talent Show episodes at fttalent.ft.com, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and follow FT Talent on socials for updates. Until next time, and keep listening. Keep listening.